Good morning. If everyone would take a seat, we'll get started. Great. So I just have you start. Hello. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, I'm Arun Chandra. I'm currently teaching with Richard Weiss a program called Computing and Music. And our students are here too. And Richard and I had applied for a Plato Lecture Series grant last uh, January or so. And we're really glad to be able to invite Austin Brown to come and talk with us, and it's part of that grant. Also, it's great to be able to join with the art lecture series and have a combined presentation with them. So uh, one of the students uh, in, in our class, uh, Alan McMorris, is going to now introduce Austin. Hi, everybody. Austin Brown is an artist living in Chicago, Illinois, holding his Master of Fine Arts from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he is a lecturer in the sound department. He received his BA from the Evergreen State College. Using a site-based practice, he works with sound, video, and installation to draw conceptual lines between sites, using buildings as evidence to investigate histories of urban planning. His work has been shown internationally at SuperSensor, Madrid, Spain, the Chicago Artist Coalition, Chicago, Illinois, The Mission, Chicago, uh, Expo, Chicago, Switched on Garden, with funding from the Pew Charitable Trust, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Delaware Center for the Contemporary Arts in Wilmington, Delaware, Rebecca Templeton Contemporary Art, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, amongst others. Hello. It feels incredible to be back here in this landscape that I grew up in and in these buildings that shaped how I move through and interact with the world. This place continues to form me as I'm still learning from my time here 12 years later. I'd like to thank Arun for the invitation and Shaw, along with everyone else at Evergreen that helped facilitate my visit. Arun asked me to talk about why I no longer use the computer in my, arti in my artistic work. And in order to do so, I'll present the last work I made with a computer from 2014, which has an entirely different set of concerns from my present work. From there, I'll discuss my current practice, focusing on three finished works and a work that will be in continual progress. From 2008 to 2014, I made compositions and installations that were based on systems and computers. I was very much interested in making art that could be seen or heard as an alternative to the systems we currently have. This is very much in line with the history of modernist composition, where one envisions an ideal set of relationships and makes work that auditions what that system might end up being. You can also see this throughout the history of art where art for art's sake was rejected, and instead artists sought for ways their work could shape and form a new society, rather than be a mirror to the existing one. For me, being a computer musician primarily, I was interested in removing the hand of the author, so I made work utilizing algorithms. In Untitled, I designed a system that used time and space. Every time the program was opened, a new map was made. The square dots on the lower right correspond to a speaker, 28 in total. The program runs sound to the speakers independently. They never overlap. And the order in which they play stays the same. The only variable is time. There are moments where there is almost zero time between the speakers, and other moments where there is more time. They modulate from being heard as independent to coming together and acting as one collective sound mass. Spatially, the order is always the same, but the room breathes as sound is amplified into it. 
The sound file I use is an electronically generated click, which generates a frequency that is incredibly perceptible to human ears. We can locate it very easily. This piece to me is a bridge. The program is intertwined with sound as a physical, non-digital material, as each speaker is placed on top of a glass whose resonant properties are amplified and changes the electronic click into an acoustic chirp. The digital map from the program becomes three-dimensional, with the wood supports lifting the sounds into the air at varying heights and are spread throughout the room in a fairly random order. So now I have to tell you why I don't do this anymore. To be honest, I of course still use computers. This entire presentation is done on a computer, and much of the work I'll share uses computers. However, this last piece, and along with it, a lot of art that deals with similar concerns, is interested in the world in an abstracted way. This piece is looking at the world as if it's a chessboard, divorced from consequence and history. We arrived at our present due to a series of actions spread through time and space, and we have to confront those actions if we want to achieve a more just society. You have to name the system if you want it changed. My practice is very research-driven. I read and write more than I make work. I love archives, but more than that, I love seeing the ways in which the past is inscribed in the present. Archives are not about telling us where we were, but rather they tell us where we are right now. And if you look closely, they tell you what is coming. After all, the future is here, just unevenly distributed. I'm going to present my work along with bits of research, sometimes blurring the distinction between them, and will sometimes use language that is not entirely my own. I'll use ideas and quotes from George Lipsitz and Richard Dyer to talk about race, and more directly to discuss whiteness, and I'll use Marshall Berman to touch on modernism. I'm not interested in being a creative person, and I'm more interested in moving things around to change context, to draw out new or interesting connections that help us understand where we are. So if you have any questions, please stop me at any time and ask them. I feel the need to define a couple of terms to help you understand about how I think of my practice. The first is geography. You might think of geography as being about maps. As my sister says, we're living in the golden age of mapping. That's not entirely wrong, but it's not the whole story. Geography is really the study of space. An oft-used analogy is history. What time is to history, space is to geography. 
Geography is the study of how space is an expression of relations between people, culture, nature, capital, and more. It's also a study of how these relationships are formed by space and how they can be maintained through space. This is foundational to how I view, interact, and make work about the world. I generally focus on cities and urban planning, which if we think about scale, are very difficult to make work about. So I've come to use buildings as evidence as a way to narrow my focus. Buildings as evidence is a term I use to show how architecture expresses, maintains, and forms social relations. I'm using it as a way to think about geography in an easier to understand scale. Buildings cement ideas of space in material and form and are useful in understanding what a particular place was thinking at a particular time. For example, David Harvey has shown that each age fashions its own environment to reflect existing social norms. The tallest structure in, in, in an 18th century English village were church spires. The tallest structure in 21st century New York was a World Trade Center. Religion, finance, then, now. I'm less interested in the form of these buildings, but I am concerned with what ideas they represent. Architects, urban planners, culture at large, city governments, and capital all have a hand in shaping these buildings and where they are placed. So it's a great tool to address all of these actors and the way they think about and create space, which we then occupy. In the 1950s, whites were leaving Chicago in droves to the newly subsidized suburbs. As a state-led effort, these newly formed suburbs created wealth for the new white middle class, but also reaffirmed an affinity for pastoral modernism. Rather than living in communities that were adjacent to or integrated with communities of color, whiteness idealizes pure and homogenous space, controlled environments, and predictable patterns of design and behavior. It seeks to hide social problems rather than to solve them. It promotes individual escape rather than democratic deliberation. So they left. Cities were left behind to rot and had to respond in some way to lure the suburban family back to the city. In Chicago specifically, the Service Employees International Union commissioned Bertrand Goldberg, an architect trained under Mies van der Rohe, to design a building whose intended purpose was to reverse white flight. The building, known as Marina City, would be built as a self-contained system, complete with a theater, restaurant, store, and other amenities meant to provide you with a city within a city. If you resided in Marina City, you no longer had to interact with Chicago. You could transplant the suburbs and live in a vertical, serene, predictable space. Marina City effectively scrambled the spatial notions of race and place, one that consisted of white suburb and minority city, while maintaining the ideology of individual escape present in the suburbs. My titles are always mined from my source materials, and in this case, the title comes from an issue of Ebony Magazine, which details the life of six black families and their encounters with racism held within the architecture of Bertrand Goldberg. If we think about the ways in which space gathers meaning, one way is to consider the bodies present in it, and how in the collision of identities a meaning is formed. Architecture is often about enclosure, and in that process, it is often defined by who is allowed to enter it and under what conditions. This is what I was thinking about when I made this work about Marina City. How does the architecture, re architecture reflect the rejection of certain bodies? How does the architecture entice others? Who is allowed under what circumstances, and how is this geography maintained? I sent out a call through Facebook, Craigslist, and email, and eventually found Joe Johnston, who, truth be told, reminded me a lot of my dad. 
met with him in his apartment and discussed the project. He was a semi-recently divorced white man who hadn't worked in a while and loves books. He was very adamant that other condos in the building were more tricked out than his, and was a bit sheepish having me look at his apartment through an aesthetic lens. We talked and watched the Cubs game. We ended up talking about his relationship to the formal aspects of the building and its history with white flight. Joe said that he has a housekeeper named Rosa that comes every two weeks. Every two weeks, Rosa comes to his apartment, goes through the hassle of security to get access into the building, and physically interacts with the curves and panes of glass placed by Bertrand Goldberg and the Service Employees International Union. Her job is twofold. Not to only maintain the building's physical form, but also the building's original intended purpose as a white space. I met with Rosa at Joe's apartment, and we talked about the work. I think she was drawn to the thought of her having agency in that space. I don't know if she thought about the building in any way other than working in it, but she found its origin story interesting. And a couple of weeks later, I went back to document her working in Joe's apartment. At first, it was very awkward. But soon, we both fell into the rhythm of working and made a bond by making fun of Joe and how dirty he is. She would let me know where she was going and what she was about to do. For in the round, I took video at 60 frames per second. Afterwards, I split the video into frames and printed them onto 35 millimeter slides, which would be played in a continuous round loop on a slide projector. The slides zero in on the choreography of the hand and the body that are maintaining the physical and ideological purpose of Joe's apartment. The projector is placed on a stand that I had built, which replicates the piece of furniture designed by Goldberg. Interspersed are, ar are archival images of Marina City, where Goldberg created a studio set of an apartment with cultural signifiers to draw in people from the suburbs. The model apartment can be read as enacting the ideal space, free from the constraints of reality. A series of formal images were taken by Hedrick Blessing to portray Marina City not only as a pure space, but one that also reaches back into history by placing the City of History by Lewis Mumford, a book that outlines significant moments of urban achievement dating back to the birth of civilization, in a photo of a desk. It can be hard to see, but this book is in the third set of archival images. The slideshow, in effect, collapses the projected image of Marina City with the mechanisms necessary for its completion. In the gallery are easy-to-miss remnants from Rose, Rose's work, which were almost thrown out multiple times during the run of the show. Placed near the entrance, away from the rest of the show, we get two perspectives. 
Coming in, we're likely to not even notice it. But as we exit the gallery, gallery, we're reminded of the performance. And we let it be the final impression of the space as we enter the street. The, the companion is Hillier Towers, made a couple years after Marina City by Goldberg. The forms are the same, gentle curves based on flowers, with the harsh concrete providing a stark counterpoint. But the considerations are the opposite. This would be public housing that would contain black bodies. Together with Marina City, Bertrand Goldberg sought to continue the modernist project of disaggregating social problems into their constituent parts. In the late 90s, public housing throughout the United States would be privatized. And here my interest was, how does a building change when its form is the same, but its intended purpose is effectively altered? Hilliard Towers faced a unique challenge. It wouldn't be torn down like most other high-rises, because of its association with Bertrand Goldberg. But it would be renovated and subsequently privately owned, which led to market rate apartments, the reduction of total public housing units, and a very high rate of vacancy. Here, the building was maintained and then altered through administration. I gathered four documents that give us three snapshots of the site over different times through different lenses, and presented them in transparent bags that are used to contain plans on building sites. Overlaid are highlights and markings I made with a blue Sharpie to draw out useful information. The first is a transcript of Bertrand Goldberg talking to Timothy, Timothy Leary about the way the form of the buildings shaped daily life. Yet these forms result in an absurd patriarchal notion of space, where the mother is given an aerial view of the concrete playground to watch her children from hundreds of feet away. The second is a page from the Chicago Defender, outlining a protest led by black mothers rallying against the site selection and the building's form. Hilliard would be an extension of the State Street Corridor, which contained public housing from Garfield Boulevard to Cullerton Street, 37 blocks. The third and fourth documents of the city, the third and fourth are documents of the city leasing the land over to the Holston Group for 100 years at no cost, with a generous tax incremental finance district to boot, leading to the privatization of the once public housing. Expressed through these documents are networks of and access to power of city, land, developers, and planners. Any diagram of these organizations looks like an octopus trying to shake hands with itself. We're moved to the outside, which is different than being complicit or unaware. You can't have modernist buildings without urban planners and policymakers changing neighborhoods. The octopus shaking hands with itself is there, but is tangled in a way that obscures itself from us intentionally. However, this will always be expressed spatially, while also having material evidence in the world. For the longest time, I felt like I was always starting over when I finished the work. But just now, I've come to the realization that my work is a continuation of whatever came before it and planning the site is no different. Why are Hilliard and Marina City placed the way they are, spaced so far apart? And why do we see this around the world? We see it in Germany, Denmark, the UK, and... In planning the site, I connect this to Corbusier who is a great touchstone to think through the contradictions of modernism. To be modern is to experience personal and social life as disorder, to find one's world and oneself in perpetual disintegration and renewal. If we use this definition 
and apply it spatially, we can imagine a space full of bodies with divergent identities colliding, and in that process, new identities being asserted, formed, and questioned. New politics are born, and society is forced to respond. In the early 20th century, there was an alternative vision of modernism, with Corbusier being one of its mentors. This is a plan Corbusier made to rebuild central Paris with 20 towers. When talking about modern space in Paris, Corbusier has a story about traversing one of Haussmann's boulevards. Quote, to leave our house meant that once we had crossed our threshold, we were in danger of being killed by the passing cars. I think back 20 years, the road belonged to us then. There's a sadness of what is lost here. And one can imagine him calling for a revolution that transforms the multitude of urban solitudes into a collaborative project and reclaim the city street for human life. Instead, he makes a leap. He identifies with the forces that have been bearing down on him. Corbusier's modern man will make one big move that will make further moves unnecessary. One great leap that will be the last. The man in the street will incorporate himself into the new power by becoming the man in the car. In other words, there are two paths modernism could take here. One is a version of modernism that transforms urban solitude into a collective reclamation of space, where all people can collide and produce new meanings together. The other is Corbusier's vision of individual space and this generates the paradigm of 20th century urban planning and design. No streets, no people. In 1928, Corbusier organized a group of European modern architects to form the Congress of International Modern Architects, or SIAM, whose mission was to advance the principles of modern architecture and urban planning. As an organization, they met roughly every other year between 1928 and 1959, producing exhibits, brochures, writings, and detailed city plans that traveled around the world, with the goal of convincing governments to, atop, to adopt their ideas. They were very influential. Cities everywhere created a modern version of pastoral urban planning, a spatially segmented world. People here, traffic there, work here, homes there, rich here, poor there, with barriers of grass and concrete in between. Once again, we find these new modern plants idealizing pure and homogenous space, controlled environments, and predictable patterns of design and behavior. Here in the States, during white flight, cities sought for ways to lure white office workers back into the city. The image of the city had turned into one of despair. Old buildings were seen as obsolete and as a visual detriment to the suburban workers navigating their way downtown. Capital wanted a clear path, physically, aesthetically, morally, to their offices. Rather than focus on, focusing on racial discrimination, unemployment, and exclusionary zoning, they looked towards architecture as the solution. What used to be there was now in the way. Even the commissioner of housing preservation in New York was on board, writing, American communities can be disassembled and reconstituted about as readily as freight trains. With Catherine Bauer as a conduit and advocate of European modernism, the United States Housing Authority and the Department of the Interior published a manual in 1939 named Planning the Site design of low-rent housing projects, detailing how to tear down large swaths of the city and rebuild them in the image of Siam. Plans were made to orient housing toward the sun at specific angles to capture light at specific times of the day at specific times of the year. The buildings were to be spaced apart to allow for greenery which was shown to create healthy and productive citizens. And streets were made long and wide, 
allowing cars to zoom past. To save money, the building practices were rationalized, essentially copying one form and repeating it over and over again, creating new space that removed people from the street and placed them into highly organized interiors with highly surveilled exteriors. So planning the site appropriates maps created by Siam and those published in the USHA manual to investigate the spread of an idea and the way spaces are connected politically. Using a common building material found in hardware stores, rolled aluminum of which one side is gold and the other silver, these maps are copied, traced, and pressed into the back of custom-made aluminum panels with Siam and silver and the USHA in gold. The plants always start from scratch, removing the hard to understand organic forms of the past. Corbusier's plan for Radiant City. These embossed panels leave us with the outline of the buildings, exaggerating the emptiness between and around them while amplifying the aerial view that did not see space as, space as social, but as a means to get somewhere else. They depict a modern life that is hollow, sterile, one-dimensional, and empty of human possibilities. Each panel is 18 inches by 36 inches, the same ratio as a city block, but also about the same size as a torso. And each one is titled what it is. For example, Diagram 18, 3,100 family units in a large eastern city. The aluminum reflects back something to you, but is distorted and not a mirror. You're kept out. Depending on the panel's relationship to the light, the embossed image can be gone entirely, reflecting the simple matte finish of the material. Alongside the panels is a six-foot-tall speaker system. The speakers are in contrast to the reflective panels carrying dirt and debris, while also being physically intimidating by their size and potential volume. Playing back recent field recordings of State Street Corridor in Chicago, which until the late 90s was the largest stretch of public housing in the United States, these recordings are nothing but ambient city sounds. Yet because of the open fields that now constitute State Street and the proximity to the highway, the recordings are perceived as white noise. The speakers continually mask any sound that could enter the gallery and are almost completely devoid of any recognizable sound outside of the stray bird call or train passing by. The highway carries with it the feeling of constant movement, but it all feels empty. The speakers are connected to an amplifier, which will be present in the video, not in this photo, that physically places the sound source, an iPod letting you know where the recording was taken, away from the loudspeakers, spacing apart the cause and the effect.
The new modern space built by Corbusier in the United States formed a new meaning that cannot be grasped from a single point of observation. It can be revealed only by movement, by going along in a steady flow. The space-time of our period can seldom be felt so keenly as when driving, moving through space. While the civic faith of our period is contingent on an America that can overcome its inner contradictions simply by driving away from them. The gallery is effectively divided into two spaces, one that is functioning as an archive of proposals, the embossed panels, and the other as an aftermath, the field recordings, looking at the continued impact of these idealized forms onto contemporary space. The moral geography of whiteness exists beyond housing and continues into newly created public space throughout cities. In 1957 in Chicago and in 1961 in New York, the cities rewrote their zoning ordinances, which allowed them to dictate with more precision what can go where. This also led to incentive zoning which says that if a building provides a public amenity, such as an atrium or plaza, they can build taller and increase their profit. Incentive zoning had the effect of creating vast, open, empty concrete spaces that were quite hostile to anyone that would want to do anything more than sit and eat their lunch for 30 minutes outside of their office. Designers, architects, and cultural leaders were left with a quandary. What do we do to humanize these spaces? They didn't want to spend the money or effort to redesign them, so instead they plopped down art. The other side effect, in collaboration with the international project, was that in order to attract global capital, these spaces had to be interchangeable. This is Chicago. This is Grand Rapids. For white noise, I'm asking, what is art's role and what is sound's role, sound's role in the production of space? I focused on two sites in Chicago. One is the Chase Building in Exelon Plaza, which was previously known as the Bank One Tower and before that, First National Plaza. This is where you'll find Chagall's Four Seasons, a wonderful mosaic made of glass and a jet fountain. The other is the Aeon Center, previously known as the Standard Oil Building. This is where you'll find a reduced collection of Pretoria's sounding sculptures. And another fountain. These public amenities, built by Standard Oil and the First National Bank, are not truly public, but private. And I want to be clear that these sites I've chosen are interchangeable with thousands of other sites around the United States. They are not unique. These privately owned public spaces are designed for people that enter the buildings and are policed through private security, often called ambassadors, to determine who is allowed to stay. Increased surveillance is accomplished not only through security, but through design. Huge expanse of glass create easy sight lines. Large open spaces keep small and hard to police nooks to a minimum. Cafes are ever present, producing a space centered on commerce rather than lingering at your own pace. Street vendors, buskers, and whoever is deemed a vagrant are kept out. This is public space created for some by excluding others. We aren't meant to inhabit the space, rather, we move, we move through it. And to note, while I was making this work, I got approached by security every single time I spent more than 30 minutes at either Chase Plaza or the Aeon Center, and was always told I could take no video. When I explained that I was taking audio recordings, they often said, for what, YouTube? And I guess I see no problem with that. In 2006, Crown Fountain, which is across the street from where I teach at the School of the Art Institute, 
was found out to have surveillance cameras on top of each video tower. After some public outcry, the city took the cameras down and moved them to another part of the park and lamented that the people's aesthetic concerns gave us something to think about. No doubt, having surveillance cameras integrated into an art object complicates the art's meaning, but equally so does integrating art into private spaces masquerading as public, even if the surveillance is an aesthetically safe distance away. In these spaces, we are subject to a field of visibility, though who is watching is very unclear. Regardless, the clarity to which these mechanisms are present is ingrained in us, and we internalize the gaze and self-regulate our behavior. However, my behavior is deemed acceptable, because after all, these spaces were designed with me in mind. I am part of the culturally regulated group that is allowed to stay. Of course, these dynamics are in play at Chase Plaza and the Aeon Center, and Chagall and Bortoya are actors, though perhaps unwittingly. In Chase Plaza and the Aeon Center, and in sites just like them around the country, they use jet stream fountains as a sound device that blocks out the noise of the city. We often talk about sound being intertwined and sculpted by architecture, where sound is acoustically manipulated by the environment it is played back into. But sound also has agency in producing meaning in, the, in that space. You can be in the center of the loop in Chicago, the second busiest commercial district in the country, and at Chase Plaza or the Aon Center, you will have the city erased from view, in image and in hearing. Art and sound are a part of the modernist project that disaggregates space and are active participants in the individual isolation that has been bedrock to how space is formed over the last 80 years. This can be difficult to see. How do you identify something that exists and shapes everything around you? White noise consists of two sets of tower speakers, each a little over seven feet tall, playing back field recordings of the jet fountains at Chase Plaza and the Aeon Center. These recordings are, once again, white noise, but there's a fidelity and a meaning here that is not present in planning the site. Rather than being a passive byproduct, the sound is placed and sculpted at Chase Plaza and the Aeon Center to generate a meaning and affect. And I think only through the removal of its context are we able to truly hear its intended consequence. I said very early that I'm not interested in being a creative person. And with this sound work, I'm not interested in arranging it in any formal manner. Instead, I'm thinking of the sound as a heavy object not only in terms of the design of the speaker boxes themselves, but in their sonic content and its duration. The way the sound occupies space is as if you're walking into a wall. The source provides us with a signal that is only perceptible as white noise. There is nothing else here. And in bi-amping the speaker system, the range is 20 to 20,000 hertz. To the left are two vertical televisions which are each given a feed from a live camera. The cameras are mounted onto glass panes, which are placed above eye height and just out of reach, with the video mechanisms easily visible from either side of the glass. Nine inches away from each camera is another glass pane with a transparent photo taped onto it as if it were pinned up to study. One photo is of, uh, is of a man unwrapping Chagall's Four Seasons the day it was dedicated, and the other of Bertoia's sounding sculptures, also from its inauguration. 
All of the forms are vertical, replicating the forms of the buildings that generated the work. The images fed to the TVs are only the blue channel from the cameras pointed at the transparencies, with one camera slightly askew to give us a portrait of the mechanisms they exist under. We're given an image not only of Chagall's and Bertoia's art, but of the site in which my art resides. This last piece I'd like to share will always be continually changing and in the most positive way. I live in Chicago and being an artist who is interested in geography and makes sense to respond to the place that I live. It's a very engaging place full of complex histories that I'll never fully understand. I began this talk mentioning my love for this landscape, the forests and the saltwater of the Northwest. It is and always will be a part of me. Fortunately, I am composed of many parts, so the prairie is with me too. The prairie used to be the second most diverse ecosystem on the planet, after the Amazon rainforest. It was full of life, composed of tall grasses that stretched deep into the soil, pulling nutrients from the earth towards its surface. Today, there is less than one-tenth of one percent left. It is, to put it bluntly, gone. The nutrients that pulled to the surface, that were pulled to the surface, turned out to be the prairie's demise, and the tall grasses and fertile soil gave way to industrial farming. In Chicago, we erased the prairie with buildings. And three years ago, my wife and I bought one that came with a concrete lot. In its place, I built a simple studio, which you've seen the inside of. I'm, of course, interested in sound. And you might be aware of acoustic ecology, a practice that uses field recordings and sound walks to bring awareness to the loss of habitat for sounding insects and birds. It exists primarily to document the changing landscape, acting as a record of what used to be there. My wife and I researched native prairie grasses, with my interest being what plants attract what kinds of sounding insects. It turns out that crickets and katydids are not all that particular. We tore up a lot of concrete and planted side oats, milkweed, mountain mint, and a collection of other natives with the hope that we would regenerate a soundscape that at one time occupied the site of our house and studio. It doesn't take much effort, really. After only two summers, the soundscape is coming back. So at its most basic level, my practice is an attempt to understand how space is formed and how I occupy it. There are moments where my research overlaps with my art and other moments where there, the correlation might not be so obvious. 
However, the research informs how I view the world, and in that process, I react and make work. So please, if you have any questions, don't feel shy. I'm an open book. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 So with the first piece, um, each speaker is fed into a cup, and that electronic click I played, I can pitch it up or down. And when I pitch it up or down, it generates a new kind of form of that click. But the acoustic property is totally sculpted by the small glass it's placed in. So I see how the context, the historical context um, of the, these sort of urban plannings and suburban plannings kind of take away agency from uh, the, ev the everyday people that live in them. Uh, and um, I guess I was going to mention how I live in a part of South Tacoma that I see is actually quite unplanned in any sort of fashion um and it's next to a busy road you know i can't interact with people across the street in any i've never have been you know i don't talk to my neighbors um and uh there's no gardens around i mean you know every now and then one shows up but uh i i see how in contrast uh with the aluminum uh, foil pieces that you had, um, while those spaces uh, might seem aesthetically unappealing, the pieces that you created actually brought to me seem to bring out something beautiful about them. And um, so given those two contradictions in mind, I guess, do you find any sort of value, especially with ecological crises coming up and the fact that there's going to be you know, more concentration camps, more prisons, more, et cetera. Um, but we have to design new ways to live. Like, is there any benefit in these sort of modern types of designs, like city? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I mean, my interest with that is twofold. Like, one, I do, I am drawn to those designs. So a lot of it is me thinking through um, why I am looking at these designs as, like, an aesthetically pleasing thing while also trying to understand um, their intent, which is pretty ugly. Um, but in terms of like new urban planning, I think we've come a long ways, and we're actually reverting back to the way the cityscapes were in the early 20th, 20th century. So you don't have these building space apart. You more have like townhomes and dense row homes and uh, density made through other means. Uh, on that note, are you part of a group, or do you know of any groups of people who are creating buildings with good intentions? So, Describing. yeah. The thing about buildings is that they're very expensive to put up, right? So, like, artists have a hard time doing it. There are some artists, like, I um, can't believe I don't remember his name, in Houston, Rick Lowe, who... Um, rehab these rows of buildings in Houston uh, and have them be in our space, but also be uh, low-income housing for specific people. So that's like an amazing place to look at. Um, so people are doing it, but it's just, it's, you know, you have to go through all these different actors, like city governments, developers, you have to find financing. So it's difficult. My wife is an urban planner. So that's where I get a lot of this. And my sister is a, a geography professor. And that's where the other part comes in. So I know people in these spaces, but to generate new architecture and new ways to build cities is just like incredibly difficult. But it is happening.
so it's not all bleak. I can I can speak without a mic. So um, okay. All right, all right. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um. So um, the direct response to that um to get on point um essentially um when you think about construction these new buildings like well was talked about earlier um you have the urban planners you have like the people running the government and like the capitalist class and all that who have a lot of influence with the construction of these new buildings and you really have to think about how is the politics of the city being ran and all that who is deciding these things is it the people who have a lot of wealth is it the wider working class I think you have to really consider um, how the politics is ran and in like the wider area. Like there are places like um, in Rojava, northeastern Syria, where it's largely the wider population that have decisions on buildings being made and all that. And that definitely has a very heavy influence on the architecture. That's what I have to say. Yeah, and I, I want to be clear that it's not um, when I'm using the term whiteness or when I'm talking about race with these designs, it's not that they're only put in place by uh, particular people. It's like an overarching idea that, and, and that idea is shaping the environment. Um, so there are individual actors, but it's also just a system that kind of exists around. And that's what I'm responding to. Thank you. Uh, um, my response, my internal response, a lot of things, so I want why you no longer use a computer. <laughs> yeah. What do you do with Mm-hmm. Sexual orientation. I don't understand the complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the first question is why I no longer use a computer. Um, yeah, I remember the piece, the first, play, the first piece I played for you all was my first uh, work in grad school. And in the critique, they were like, we didn't understand it, right? Like, I'm thinking through all of these ways that space is formed, and then I make an abstracted piece that no one has any uh, kind of engagement with. There's nothing pointing to the real world that they can then enter the piece through that way. Um, in terms of the second question, I think... It's funny, because I studied under Arun in undergrad, and we talked about cybernetics, and we talked about uh, computer music. And for me, I was never interested in portraying my personal feelings or like using art as an outlet, like an emotional outlet. But that said, I do feel like with a piece like White Noise, the sound is giving you a fairly obvious feeling about the work, right? It's fairly, um, it's, uh, it makes me feel like I'm walking into a brick wall. Like I can't, go into these spaces, even though I'm culturally allowed to, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's complicated, because I do appreciate these forms as what they are. And then like understanding the history of it, it makes a new meaning. And then in that new meaning, I'm trying to give you two things. I'm trying to give you an aesthetic object that allows you to enter the history in a new way, right? It's different than just like reading a book. Um, but I'm not personally interested in having it be an emotional expression of my own work. Yeah, 
yeah, I mean, I think I'm not actively trying to do it, but it'll always be there. Yeah. Um, maybe to follow up on what he soon was saying, there was something about doing work at your house that seemed really different from yeah. the work in these really hostile spaces that seemed to me um, like there was kind of a poignant scene and in intimacy and there's a um, like a something about that domestic space and yeah. being able to um, work in a space like that. And then suddenly the natural world like appears in, yeah, in your yeah. work, which is, mm -hmm. I think that was, that was really apparent to me, the contrast in those two kinds of work. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, 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 it'd be interesting to hear more kind of what it's like to work at your house and then totally separate question. I just, now I can't think about waterfalls in the same way. Now that I'm thinking about them as these kind of sound blockers in these mm -hmm. plazas um, yeah. and waterfalls as these incredibly hostile <laughs> things yeah. um even though and i guess that does connect because it's water it's actually a natural element in this completely man-made environment mm -hmm. but the water is so um engineered yeah um in a particular way so yeah i mean in terms of my own house and studio like i live there so i want it to be like a very relaxing pleasing place to uh exist and have dinner and then make work and come out and like see the alley cats, feed the alley cats, you know? Um, yeah, so, like, I, you know, I'm multiple parts. I want um, a domestic space that reflects my aesthetic choices, and I want it to be pleasing. Um, but I view my artistic practice as, you know, something different, where it's more about trying to understand where I am. Um, I guess I would say, thinking of the difference between the studio and the site of production versus the more research-oriented things, with the studio, I'm producing a new space, right? So that's like a big thing for me is I think that's where my work will go is how to produce new spaces, which we've talked a little bit in terms of kind of more grand ideas of architecture and urban planning. Uh, so this is like a little snippet of that. Um, but in terms of waterfalls, like I do like, like that sound, you know, it's like, it's hard, but I don't know if anyone's here listened to Mersbau or anything. Like there are very intense pieces of noise music that I think are aesthetically pleasing. Um, so even though it is like a full force, there to me, like I spent days and days and days mixing it as like a like an aesthetically pleasing thing for me. So basically, you're done using computers for now, or because this is the last piece you're working on. I doubt it's, and it's ongoing, but I doubt it's going to be the last thing you work on forever. Right. So, you um, made a decision to cut computers out of your palette, or? Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, I still use computers. Like, this whole thing exists on a computer. But the difference is that I'm not using a computer to design these new kind of auditory systems to audition a set of relationships, right? And now I'm interested in seeing, looking into the world and trying to understand the relationships that are already, already existing. So to me, like there's a difference between making a piece of computer music and thinking through how these different sounds are relating to each other and you're gonna have a larger political idea behind that too. And I did for a long time. Um, but for me right now, I'm more interested in using cities and the earth to understand how relationships are formed. But to answer your question in uh, a more finite thing, yeah, I'll probably go back to using computers at some point. Who knows? Um, a comment on your comments about Le Corbusier, the architect, and the other architects that designed things that um, that you correctly appraised the, a critical look at. Um, is it the case that the critical look that one takes as the past is necessary to establish what needs still to be done? And then is it possible that 
Corbusier and others at the same time were seeing the problems of their past and responding with what they thought was a positive direction. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, they were they were dealing with an entirely different set of circumstances that we exist in now. Um, but for me, what I was interested in was not only their design, but how their design was used as a way politically to remake American cities. Right. So it's there was a certain point in the '60s that we understand that these designs were bad and that by nature, you were having to wipe out whole sections of neighborhoods in order to make them. Um, but what happened was that they used those designs and they used um, certain ideas of environmental determinacy to erase what was there. And I think that was the problem, one of the problems. So I guess uh, half of this is a comment, but I thought it was interesting. Um, you talked earlier about uh, these city planners who design these public housing spaces from the wrong perspective, from an aerial perspective where they weren't designing a social space. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was an interesting parallel to you using a computer to abstract something to a point where people felt like they couldn't interact with it. Um, where it wasn't social. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, this sounds like a stretch, but VR or the way technology is moving to where it becomes more interactive or social, where a computer could be used to make something that is, is better for people than maybe what, they would, what would naturally occur. Because row houses are cool and neighborhoods are cool, but they're not perfect social spaces, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the guy's name who works for the BBC? Is it Adam Curtis who had that movie? Um, it was all about the internet and the way the internet was formed, and then the internet became co-opted. Uh, does anyone know it? Adam Curtis? Yeah, hypernormalization. Um, so it's true that we can use computers and these technologies to pr produce new spaces, but that doesn't mean that they're safe from being commodified. Um, so just because you're using technology doesn't mean that it's by nature going to produce like a, a positive social space. You still have to think about the way in which it's used. Um. So one of the things that I was hearing in the, the previous answers was that you decided to stop using computers in your work partially because previous works had been more abstract and you decided to be a more documentary in, in your uh, art approach. And I guess um, given the sophistication of the abstraction in your previous work, and given that you're not ruling out using computers forever, if you could sort of hypothesize how you would start to bring in computers to be a tool for documentation rather than a tool for abstraction. Yeah. Um, so tomorrow is an eight-channel uh, piece here. I don't know what room it's in. Oh, Friday, yes. Uh, Friday, there's a series of eight-channel uh, compositions being performed. Um, and white noise, the last piece, will be a part of it. So there I'm using the intended source, or like the, uh, the, I'm using the source and its meaning, but I'm also using it as a way to generate an A-channel composition, right? So there I'm using kind of two things. I'm using uh, more formal aspects to express the sound and the way it occupies space, but I'm also concerned with its meaning and why it's there, right? Um, so I see that maybe kind of answering your question. And uh, my next work, maybe not my next one, but I'm also interested in kind of how sound is used in general to form space. Um, so in Chicago, they, the police department has these things called, I think they're called Ipsy catchers, 
where they can track people's cell phones and, and, and take audio from them. Um, so that'd be one way that I would use a computer to look at the way sound is used as a, as a mechanism for controlling space. Thanks so much, Austin. Um, I like that you referenced plop art and, and that <laughs> yeah. public art, and yeah. um, it 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 kind of made me th a dream a little bit about like Alexander Calder instead of him plopping that work around those plazas and our urban centers. That that the his work was more like your work that was sort of referencing and critiquing some of the mm -hmm. the urban centers. Um, and like so that's like a little bit of where this question's coming from but what are your thoughts about um the spaces that you do show your work in you know cuz a lot of them are interior spaces and i'm not sure if they're public or private or institutional and like yeah. who's allowed in those spaces um who's the the audience for that work um and and you know i think it's an interesting thing that you're bringing like the outside into those empty spaces and mm -hmm. and, and and so like, what are those spaces about? And, like, what about bringing the work outside to those plazas? Or is that just yeah. too redundant? Or yeah. No. Um, so my work generally exists in artist-run galleries. Um, so they're open, but, you know, it's still the art world. So there is a certain amount of enclosure there, no doubt. Um, I see my work in the future becoming more public and using, like, the plaza that is surrounded by Mies van der Rohe with Calder in the middle as a way to talk about these issues. Um, but you also need like a certain amount of social capital to like start making these works exist in the public for a duration. Um, it also takes a certain personality, right, to, to do that. But I think in the long run, that's where I see my work existing, is out in those kind of specific contentious spaces. So the question was, how do I make the audience become self-conscious of the spaces they inhabit? Well, one way is to write a paper and read that paper to all of you. That's one way. Uh, that's probably the most direct and easiest way. Uh, oftentimes when I exhibit work, I'll have text or I'll have like a set of writings about the work and like about kind of more general notions of space. Um, for example, in white noise, there are the video feeds, where if you're in the way, you get projected onto the TV. So right there, you're immediately thinking of how you're occupying that space, and you're thinking of the way in which that might uh, inform a new meaning onto that space. Um, yeah, it's a very difficult thing. And I think, for me, I see research as like a very integral part of my practice. So it's not just making an art object or a composition and performing it or letting it, letting it exist in the gallery. I see it all tied into one practice. So a big part of that is writing. Um, just thinking about your exhibition on the modern buildings, I'm wondering how you went about grabbing resources um, in terms of the documents that you had on the walls and the design plans. Did you have to collaborate with the people who designed the buildings or anything like that? Um, so I'm very fortunate to teach at the School of the Art Institute, which has a ginormous archive library of all of these architectural plans within Chicago. So a lot of my practice is going there and pulling out stacks and researching them. Um, also, city governments, they're pretty good at putting all of their documents online. So you can also 
get these things pretty easily. Um, so yeah, it's just like mining archives and mining uh, resources. But there's no direct involvement with any of the architects or um, planners. I just wanted to know if you did any other work like uh, the kind you did with, uh, was his name was Drew Johnston. Oh, uh, Joe Johnston? Yeah, the, or Joe? Yeah, Joe. Oh. Uh, I just found that really, um, it was a fantastic story and decision that you made. Um, learn about this, that, you know, to develop the whole process. So have you done anything else like that? I have. I haven't presented them, um, but I have other works. One work was... Um, going to the oil fields in North Dakota and looking at the way uh, migration patterns kind of change the landscape there in relationship to uh, material being pulled out. So there it was like talking to researchers uh, at University of North Dakota and talking to people that are living there. Um, so it is part of my practice to talk to these people that are occupying these spaces. Uh, I guess neither one of White Noise or Planning the, planning the Site do that directly. Um, but even there, like when I'm recording, people still stop and talk to me, right? Like there is a security guard who was asking me if I was like what I was doing. He thought it was very strange that someone would go out there with a big fluffy microphone and record this stuff. Um, so yeah, there, I do see some room to make more work about the people that inhabit these spaces. Uh, but yeah, Joe Johnson is like a very... Like, nice story. So I included it. I have one question about what you said twice, that you don't make creative work. Can you... That means... Yeah, so, like, most of my work is either um, grabbing an archive and copying it or tracing it or taking a photo and putting a video camera on it or taking an audio recording and just playing it back. So I don't really see those as being... Um, one thing I run into with my students is that people think that there's, this, uh, there's a way to be an artist. Right? Like you have to be in your studio, you have to be creative, you have to like, let the moment affect you and then you respond and make work. And as a lot of us know, that's not how it actually is. So part of it is that I'm not interested in being a creative person where I'm letting like an emotional outlet. I'm more interested in taking one thing and moving it and in that movement kind of changing the meaning. You're equating creative with emotion rather than aesthetic decision or... Yeah, for this talk, yeah. Um, continuing based off of Shaw's question, earlier you said that you weren't interested in presenting your work in a formal way, I think is how you phrased it. And mm -hmm. I was wondering what you meant by that, because it's not creative in the way that it's not emotional, like you said, mm -hmm. but clearly you still have to think about the way that the viewers are going to interact with it, right? Yeah. So how do you go about creating an uh, exhibition without presenting the work in a formal way. Yeah. So um, I can check my notes, but I think I said I'm not interested in composing sounds in a formal way. Uh, it, so with like both of the sound pieces, it's just on off, right? There's, it's not like I'm uh, making them into discrete sound objects and having them uh, portray certain relationships between pitches or anything like that. It's just on off. Um, but in terms of an exhibition, I'm not think I do think about the way these objects and the sound occupy space, but I'm not interested in like making a painting for painting's sake, for example, or exploring formal properties of these objects because they're also like normal objects, right? Just rearranged a little bit. Um, so it's not a great question. I do think about form and I do think about aesthetics, uh, but I don't let that drive the work. Right? Like it's more like I'm reacting to whatever is in front of me, and uh, I'll just copy one thing, put it on a new material, and then place that somewhere.
I would like to preserve the notion of creativity in that you uh, you make artworks or things in that invite the audience to rethink something that they have um, might not have noticed or might not have thought about. And that invitation to rethink is, for me, a socially and a creative step. Socially, because it invites the audience to think about what's around them and creatively because nobody else has invited me to do that other than you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I remember in my last critique in grad school, a uh, painting professor asked me if I was an artist. Um, so that's, I think, where some of this comes from, is me saying, no, it's okay if I'm not an artist, right? Like, my wife is an urban planner, and she does creative work all the time, but she wouldn't necessarily consider herself a creative person, right? So, like, uh, I think maybe... I'm thinking of it as losing the act of creation allows everyone to feel like they have agency to create. Does that make sense? 